Okay, the passing of the piece. Uh, it'll be in sign language. We want to do the peace of Christ. The Old Testament today is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him from the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heaven and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded that they were created. He established, he established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth. You see monsters in all depths, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy and fulfilling his commands. <clears throat> Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. He is glory above earth and heaven. He, passed, uh, uh, he has raised up the, a horn for his people. Praise, all, praise for all his faithful for the people of Israel are close to him. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks to God. God. Good the epistle today is Acts 11, uh, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had accepted the word of God. And when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and feed them? And eat with them. And Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in the trance I saw a vision. There was something like a huge sheep coming down from heaven, <coughs> being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. But I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, <clears throat> kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. <clears throat> but the second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you shall not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. <clears throat> At that very moment, three men came to me from Caesarea, <clears throat> arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make distinction between them and us. These six brothers who accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us, he told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, saying, Send for Joppa and bring Simon, who is also called Peter. He will, give, he will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. When he began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the great gift that he gave us, when we achieve, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And who, who, who was I that I should hinder God? And who was I that I should hinder God? <clears throat> when he heard this, they were silenced. And they then praised God, saying, hey, Then God has given them even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This also is the word of the Lord.
Thank you for the lovely music and also thank for your warm welcome and thank you Kurt for uh, leading the first part of the service this morning. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel according to John in chapter 13 and reading from verse 31 to 35. Um, this is in the upper room. It's just after Jesus has celebrated the his last, given the last supper to the disciples and washed the disciples' feet. And the first words of this passage refer to he is Judas who, um, who had gone out uh, to do what he was going to do. When he'd gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. This is also the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this is time for our moment with young Christians, so... You are invited to come down to the front, but if you if you want to stay in the, in the pew beside your family, you're welcome to do that as well. So, um, but I'm going to come down down the steps um, to encourage those who want to come forward. <laughs> so that's close enough. <laughs> Back to go. Go and, go and sit down on your carpet beside the other kids. <laughs> Who's that big boy? Okay, she, 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 she's with me, so it's okay. <laughs> right, you can hold my hand. Let's come down. So, anyway, um, today we're learning about loving one another just as Jesus loved us. When I was a young man, about 18 years old, and I'll tell the congregation more about this later. I went to a church where there was lots of young people, and I learned a new song. I'd never heard it before, but I learned a new song in this church. And, and it was it was one that's in your hymn book, I believe, and it goes, A new commandment that I give to you is to love one another as I have loved you is to love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all know you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. By this shall all know you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. Now, the reason Jesus said that, we said, we heard about it in our reading, and the reason Jesus said this is because he had shown the disciples how to love each other. He just washed their feet. Because loving and being a leader, to be a leader is not to be the boss, right? Everybody thinks if you're a leader, you're the boss. No. I... Yeah, what do you want to say? Just to listen to everybody's opinion. It's to listen. It's not always to do what people want, but it's to listen. <laughs> and also, it's to serve. It's to serve. And if you want to be a leader, you need to serve those you seek to lead. And Jesus showed his disciples that they had to love each other, and they had to serve each other, even to do what nobody else wants to do, and that's to get down and wash other people's feet. And being a leader sometimes has, is to do with being a, 
being uh, doing things that nobody wants to do, or being being, uh, being the one who who draws the sleeves up and gets in beside everybody when when the tough when the going gets tough. So loving and serving and leading, Jesus says, if if you love one another, people other people will see and they will believe too, and they will want to, they will want what you've got. They will want to join in because you're doing something, a lovely thing. And that's what it means to love one another, to serve and to, to help each other in difficult times. So, I believe, oh, there's a bathroom through here if you need to go. Do you need to go? <laughs> Probably get ready to go to church now, it's Sunday school now. You're going to go to Sunday school now? Yeah. Honey, come. 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 Sorry. I know they want to join us in Sunday school. Come on. Don't scare them. Right. I need to stop wearing your name. And, uh, <laughs> they'll take care of themselves. Y'all go to Sunday school now. Mommy will take you. There's a, there's, a, there's a restroom through there. So it's now time for your sermon. Um, so you, you had a bonus song already. You could have a bonus hymn today as well, but I'm going to resist doing that because I don't want it to go, take us into overtime. Um, because we're going to be somewhere else in a, in a short while. When I offered, uh, when, when, when I'm asked to, to give a sermon title, because many pastors don't put a title on, uh, don't offer a title, because when you start preparing your sermon at the start of the week, the Holy Spirit doesn't give you the luxury of sticking to the same subject or the same the same. Uh, the same uh, message at the end of the week. So um, my title could often change as the week goes on. It could have been, could have been, uh, I offered, it could have been one in Christ, we belong to God, but I'm going to stick with, well, we belong to God might, might come through, um, but a new commandment is where we're starting from. What we've just heard. So let's begin with a new commandment. Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment, which sounds a lot like the great commandment to love God and love your neighbour as yourself. But Jesus was, when Jesus gave the great commandment, he was quoting, he was really expanding the law of Moses. He was, he was re, re, uh, reiterating what the law of Moses really, really says. But the new commandment was given to the disciples so that the believers could witness to what the gospel really does in their lives. So that others might see and believe. After, uh, thanks for Kurt for, for the brief uh, introduction. Um, I, I was born in Edinburgh and after spending the first seven years of my life in Edinburgh, um, we moved to a, a wee town called Pennycook to live in the country where we could, we could have a house with a garden because as you know when you've got small children there's nothing better than to have a house with a garden. So it was good to live down there in, in, in a wee place but we moved back, after the high school years, we moved back into the city. And so when I was about 18, I went along with my mother to a new church. When you move into a new area, you've got to check out which church you're going to go to. So we went to one or two churches. And my mother, who was um, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland member in the family, my father was, was raised in the Church of England. And so, um, see, he didn't have a clue, really. So... Um, <laughs> So um, he, he, he was uh, and he was busy driving his taxi, so he would be asleep by the time we got up to go to, to church. But he did occasionally um, uh, frequent the Episcopal Church in Scotland, which is the Anglican uh, equivalent in Scotland. 
So we would go along to the Church of Scotland and we went to this new church and it, Edinburgh being a university city has uh, big churches full of young people and professors and lawyers and sort of like, sort of like all the, the, the kind of like the high flyers of society, what we would call in Scotland the high regions, right? So um, these people were, uh, it was the great and the good really, you were amongst the great and the good, you know, people actually got dressed up to go to church, you know, and, and folk uh, and folk were quite kind of like um, lived in these big stone houses and the church was one of these big sandstone buildings with a tall steeple and bell that could be heard for miles. It was like a big church, it had, it had a badminton club, a, a, even a golf club or a tennis club. It had young people and old people, it had a choir, it had, it had welcomers, people with badges and saying, I'm your welcomer today and people on the door and, and folk came and there was a buzz, a great buzz about the, the building and there was always something going on and there was a Sunday school and youth fellowship and we went to, I went along to the youth fellowship and there were all these young, in fact it was, it was what happens after youth fellowship, they were called, they called themselves the Chronicles um, because they were chronic but um, they, were, they were older teenagers, they were young students and, and sort of like young professionals, went on to this group when I was 18 and, and, um, and, and they had something, they had something special going on and I wanted to be part of that and I, and I, I saw what they had and I said, I want some of that. Because they loved each other with us, with a love, with the love that Jesus loved, with acceptance and with a, with a kind of serving and a, and a brotherly love that was, I'd never experienced before. Because I've got a brother, and I know what brothers are like. <laughs> so they had the marks of discipleship. And they, they, I, was le I learned about serving and leading. On Sunday evenings after the service, I went along to the youth fellowship, and we would sing a new commandment that I give to you, is to love one another. And we had all these choruses, I'd never, I'd never heard them. It was almost like there'd been a conspiracy of silence in, in the church that we'd gone to before. They didn't tell you about, they, they told you about Jesus, but they didn't tell you about the gospel. About the same time, I also started going to the new communicants class to jo learn about joining the church. And I learned that to become a disciple of Jesus, you didn't have to be circumcised, you didn't have to be respectable, you didn't have to get dressed up, you didn't have to change your appearance. You didn't have to be rich or good. Because I thought you had to be good to be a Christian. You certainly had to undergo any physical changes. Only had to come as you are. Just as I am. And God would love me and, and love you and accept me as one of God's children. In our reading from the book of Acts today, and Acts 11, 1 to 18, we learn that Peter, who was growing the church among the Gentiles, was getting opposition from the, the Jewish Christians, or the Jewish followers of Jesus. These were known as the circum... And the, and the ones who were the most extreme were called the circumcision party. I don't know if there, there, were, there was actually a party. <laughs> But this reminds us that the Jews, the Judaism was the cradle from which Christianity stepped. So the fledgling church was really still a sect of Judaism. And the Jewish believers required, they, they were insisting that the Jewish purity laws, the food laws and circumcision and and separation from the unclean, the, the un great unwashed, was, 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 was maintained. It was as if the outward things mattered more than the spiritual life within the heart. And Peter, who was a Jew, now if you remember when Peter and the disciples were with Jesus, they ne it never struck me that they were really that devout and you, they didn't 
do all this religious observance. You know, they, they ate when and where they wanted. They, you know, the, the fishermen were fairly rough and ready, and Jesus hung about with some, uns, well, unsavory people in the eyes of the religious elite. So, I find it hard to, 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 to relate the Peter that we know from the Gospels to the Peter who we encounter in the book of Acts. It's almost as if he's conformed to the religious expectations of Judaism in order to try and, maybe to try and win people for Christ. But it's, it's unusual. It's, I don't recognise this Peter because I can't imagine this Peter that we hear about in Acts as the same Peter that we hear about in the Gospels. But maybe, or maybe he was just spinning a yarn just to keep people happy, I don't know. But he was a Jew, just as Jesus was a Jew, and he was being criticised by the, the devout Jews, the, the, circums the circumcisers, for entering the home of Gentiles and eating with them, who were regarded as unclean. But God had told them in a vision, and God had shown him in this vision three times, that's how important this was. He showed him in this vision three times that nothing that God has made and has said is good. Refer back to the creation story. What God had made, he said, was good. Nothing that God has made and said is good. Neither food, nor human, the human body, nor people of any tradition or other race must be called unclean. Peter had been given permission by God to open up this new church movement to Gentiles. No person was unclean. No food was unclean. And nobody had to undergo any kind of circumcision. Heaven forbid. You know what? In Scotland, you don't get circumcised when you're a baby. That would be child abuse. <laughs> so I don't know why it happens in America. And who, who wants to make the baby cry in one has to? This would expand the new believers from a hundred or so to thousands and eventually millions across the world. So the church would become the most powerful force of change and good the world has ever seen. When once you had to undergo strict entry requirements, including the physical act of circumcision, now all we have to do is to believe and love the Lord and love each other and through our baptism in which we are buried with Christ and raised with him through faith. For in this, we, in this way we surrender our will to God in Christ because that is the circumcision of the heart. St. Paul writes in his letter to the Colossians, it's not for the physical body that needs to be circumcised by the spirit within our hearts. It's, it's the spirit within our hearts that needs to be circumcised as an act of obedience as we surrender our sinful past to God. We learn from our reading in Acts that the threat and the pain and the disunity of sectarianism, because really that's what this, this adherence to strict or any kind of strict observance creates, it creates sectarianism. Sectarianism in the church, as in any religion, can be very harmful to the unity of the body, in our case the body of Christ. The church and our oneness in Christ depends on an openness to the Holy Spirit and an openness to God and God's love and unity through love and the Spirit, not through outward appearances or strict observance 